During the month of Family Month, we had hundreds of powerful stories of reconciliation between family members and individuals taking practical steps to have healthier families. We had a dad at one of our campuses who had been navigating a divorce, but knew it was important to keep his kids in church. Turns out it's exactly what he needed as well. As he's been healing and putting in the work, staying connected at church has kept him grounded and has been a highlight each week and in the lives of his kids. One woman who visited the church for the first time with her son during family month told us, I never thought church could be like this. I needed this in my life and I need to invite my family. The very next week, she brought her ex and her new partner with her to church. This was an amazing moment to see families coming together. I am just so grateful for the way that God has moved in the lives of our families here at South Hills during the month of Family Month. I also want to take a moment and give you an update of where we are with closing the year. When I shared with you in the month of October of what we were short in order to end the year, that number was $2,004,424. We are now at $1,643,902 to close the gap by the end of the year. If you look at this graph, you can see how we break up every single dollar. 46% of that dollar goes to campus and central staff so that we have staff that are leading our church. 28% of that dollar goes to campus ministry and community outreach so that we can make sure that we're doing everything possible to let people know we are here to love them and walk through life with them. 16% of every dollar goes to our mortgages and our rental fees for all of our locations, which is the building that you are currently sitting in. And 10% of every dollar goes to facility upkeep and operational costs to keep our locations up and running. I wanted to share this with you because here at South Hills, we want to be open and honest with everyone so that you know exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. And as we get ready to continue to trust God with our finances and trust God with every aspect of our life, I want to begin to introduce to you something that we're going to start this year, and it's going to be called Big Give Tuesday. Every year, I want to give our church the opportunity to trust God in bigger and greater ways. So I want to challenge you as a family or as an individual, whatever your household is, I want you to ask God what would he have you do for Big Give Tuesday? What will he want you to contribute towards November 29th as we approach this day? And why are we doing this? Because we believe that lives will be changed through this process as we allow God to transform us and trust him with our lives. Anybody ever found uh, themselves craving a snack or a food? <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, this happened to me about two weeks ago. I was uh, at age five, I was working, and all of a sudden, I got this craving of having French fries. But not just any French fries, okay? We're talking about McDonald's French fries. McDonald's French fries are the best. Who, who's with me? You guys are Christians. You guys are going to heaven with me. Uh, and the second one that I run her up is in and out fries. They're, they're good as well. But I had this craving at, uh, on having French fries. So I was in the office and I stopped working uh, because I'm a good Christian, right? And I went to McDonald's, which is like three blocks from the office. And I was super excited. Um, I saw it was super full. So I didn't want to go inside and order like this extra large bucket of fries. Um, I don't even know that, that, if that exists, but it's all right. Um, um, so I went through drive through So as I made my left turn to go into a drive through I was super excited because there was not a lot of people in drive through I was about to go in drive through when all of a sudden this red car cuts in front of me. And I, because I'm a good man, I'm a good pastor, I start honking. <laughs> Beep! I'm a pastor. I got upset. I got so mad because I wanted my fries. This person with the red car cut right in front of me. You know why I was upset? Because she was disrespecting. I said it. I said she. It was a she. 
She drove in front of me. She was disrespecting the system. You have to go in back of me or in back of the car that's in back of me. Wait. Get up to the teller. Tell them what you want. Go to the first window. Pay. And then anxiously and gloriously wait for your food. But this lady cuts in front of me. In other words, she went out of order. Everybody say order. She was out of order. And when I, like, you know, let go of that, that, that honk thingy, I'm all like, oh, God, before you forgive her, forgive me. <laughs> forgive me, I have sinned for wanting French fries. I mean, for getting mad. But she disrespected the system. She disrespected the order. And perhaps this has happened to you, whether you were in a drive through or in a meat market buying meat to barbecue or even um, when you were in line to pay some, something, somebody gets in front of you and you're like, well, what's going on? You, you don't react in a good way. If we're honest, we don't react in a good way. And partially it's because we feel like they're cheating us. We honestly feel like they're cheating us, that something's wrong. And partially... We get mad, you know why? Because you and I like order. You and I like the things to be done in the right way, in a certain way. See, you and I, we like order to our morning routines. Don't talk to me because I haven't had my coffee yet. You don't receive texts, emails, nobody could talk to you unless you have your coffee. We, we like order to our property possessions, right? You can't move into an apartment without signing the lease first. First, you have to sign the lease, agree on the lease, monthly lease fee, and then you move in. How about this one? And this might take you off guard. But there's order to personal presentation. You don't get dressed, and excuse me for saying this, you don't get all dressed and then you put your underwear on. You put your underwear on first, and then you get fully dressed. There's an order, right, to your personal presentations. See, if we go out of order, doing things out of order causes a lot of confusion and disorientation. Which also causes anxiety in us, right? It's that feeling that something's off. That feeling that, that, feeling that something's not right. It, it, something's not, it's out of our control. Something is out of order. And of, on the flip side of anxiety, it's peace. It's order. It's calmness. Once again, everybody say order. And here's why I bring this up. Because a lot of us feel the most tension and anxiety and disorder and chaos on the subject of money. Isn't it funny we all agree that there's an order to almost everything. But once we suggest that there might be an order on to how we ought to organize our money, we immediately get defensive and frustrated. Ooh, you can't touch my money. It's mine. And this is why I love South Hills. Because we don't take the time during the year to speak into depression. We don't, uh, we take the time during the year to speak into depression and a lot of top topics. And we even speak about what Jesus spoke about a lot. See, there are over 500 verses in scripture concerning faith. There's over 500 scriptures, uh, uh, it, it, there's over 500 verses in scripture concerning prayer. But did you know there's over 2,000 verses in scripture regarding money? I, I think Jesus was on to something. Is Jesus trying to tell us something regarding our money? Because if there is an order to our money and how we use it, then what is it? Glad you asked. Let me share something with you this morning. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, if you brought your Bibles, you can open them to Genesis. If you have your, your app, you can do that now. If not, we have the verses here, Genesis 4. And it's coming up. Here it is. Let's read it. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. 
And she said, I have obtained a male child with the help of the Lord. So Adam and Eve, right, they, they slept together, first couple, first family, first, uh, 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 first people that God put on earth. And, and Adam was the one that physically got Eve pregnant. Would you agree with me? She, he physically got her pregnant. And, but yet she gives credit to God. I have obtained a male child with the help of Adam. With the help of the Lord. This tells you that these two people believe that everything good came from God. Everything good came from God. And so like, you know, they, they, they slept together. And what happens when you sleep together and you're intimate? Uh, you have babies. And if we continue verses 2 to 5, it says, And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a cultivator of the ground. So it came about in the course of time. Everybody say that where it's yellow. About in the course of time. Ready? One, two, three. About in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. Verse 4, Abel on his part also brought an offering from the firstborn. Say firstborn. Of his flock and from their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his face was gloomy. Now, I want you to notice something. This is super, super uh, interesting. Every time Cain and Abel got something good, anytime they got a hold of resources in their hands, it was automatic that they would give it to God. And it was because the parents, Adam and Eve, that's how they brought them up. So Cain and Abel, every, every time they had something in their hands, resource, every time they, they were blessed, they will honor and give it to God. Now, I think this is extremely interesting because there was no rule back then saying that they needed to do this. There was no law at this point of history saying that they actually needed to honor God with it. So they bring the offering to God and he accepts one but rejects the other. I mean, they both gave. I mean, isn't that the point? They both gave. But here's the thing. They didn't give the same thing. And they didn't do it in order. See, Abel gave God his best first. And Cain gave God his leftovers when he got around to it. In other words, Cain gave in the course of time. Oh, yeah, I forgot I need to give to God. Oh, here, God. And when he did give, he gave his leftovers. Abel gave us his firstborn. Abel gave to God first his fat portion, meaning the best. And Cain, his leftovers. And guess what Cain did? He gave out of order. He gave God last. When? He had time. See, he didn't put God first. See, we, you and I, as Jesus followers, as Christians, we like the idea of putting God first. But if we're honest with each other, our practice is to put ourselves first. Which turns out, I'll say it again, which turns out to be the order most of us Living and given. Let me show you what I mean. Put up the slide, please. So what do we do first? You spend it. You first. It's all you first. Second, wait, what do we do most of the time? We pay creditors second. We repay debt. Third, we give to government, right? We pay taxes. Fourth, we, it's a future me. We save it. And fifth, here comes God. We give it. We are trying to be generous. See, we like to think we're generous. But if giving is last on our list, we're handling God's money out of order. 
And I know this is difficult to hear. I know. Now, if you're not a Christian, generosity isn't a requirement for you. It's optional. But if you call yourself a Christian, don't pretend you put God first if giving is last. I know that sounds harsh. But it's the principle that we read in the passage. Essentially, God rejects Cain's offering because he gave of his leftovers. Because Cain gave just a tip. Here, God, here's your tip. Oh, I remember. Ooh, here, here you go. See, God doesn't want your leftovers. God doesn't want your tips. You know what he wants? He doesn't even want your money. He wants this. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And how is this verse relevant to us this morning? If we focus our time, our energy uh, on building wealth for ourselves here on earth, our, heart, our hearts will be focused there. That's where our treasure will be. See, God doesn't want your money. God is not broke. I'll say it again. God is not broke. He don't need our money. He doesn't. He, I mean, he's not like three months late paying his AC in heaven. He doesn't want our money. He's after our heart. Because if he has our heart, if he has your heart, he'll be first. He won't be competing with the creditors. He won't be competing with your future. He won't be competing with the stuff, the toys, our clothes that we want to buy instead of giving to him. See, when you give the first of your resources, what you're really doing is giving the first and best of your heart. And Abel, what was Abel communicating? God, I got you. You are first. My firstborn, the fat portion, this is yours because you are first. Abel, uh, Cain, what was he communicating? Oh, God, you're welcome to, uh, to whatever I don't want because I have other priorities in my heart. See, it's the attitude of the heart. It's the leftover mentality that God is rejecting. See, living blessed means acknowledging God as your priority and provider by actively giving him your best first. And as we've seen, when you do things in order, like Abel, it produces peace, calmness. It produces a blessing. And when you do things out of order, like what Cain did, it plunges you into chaos. It stirs up anxiety, which Cain was experiencing. And if you know the story of Cain, it was so much anxiety. He did things with money that was like super out of order and that it led him to even kill his brother. And God's reaction to that was, hey, you know what? I still love you, Cain. I, I, I really do love you. But if you don't, that's what happens, Cain, when you don't prioritize me. That's what happens when you prioritize yourself over me. The chaos, the anxiety bleeds over into other areas of your life. You thought, Cain, you were cheating me, but no, you were cheating yourself. Because now, Cain, you're unfulfilled, you're empty, you're living in chaos, you just, you, you're a murderer. Now, you're a wanderer. See, Cain did not live out his best life. I'll repeat it again. God doesn't need you to give. You need you to give. You need you to give. He wants the best for you. And that's the heart behind this ancient practice that we do and still as a church participate in today. And it's called tithing. Tithing is giving the first 10 of all you give back to God through your local church. Tithing is not a spiritual tax. 
<laughs> Let's get that out of the way. Tithing is not a, a church tax to keep the lights on. No, it's not, it's not that. It's not about, you know, keeping God off your back and ensuring bad things won't happen to you. At its core, it's about acknowledging God, putting him first. And maybe you're wondering, you're, you're here and you're like, well, prove it. When did tithing start? Where is it in scripture? Glad you asked. I'm going to put up a couple of verses on board. I'm not going to read them on the, on the screen. I'm not going to read them. You can take pictures or take notes and you can study them at, at home. Exodus 23, 19, it says, bring your first to God. Leviticus 27, 3 says, give your first of all, tenth of all, everything you have. And Malachi, which is very famous, Malachi 3, 10, says, bring the tithe into the temple and be blessed. Why don't we all... Let's all stand up. Let's do something for, for a minute. Let's all stand up and let's like do this. Yeah. All right, we can sit back down. Oh, yes. Because here comes the good stuff. Maybe you're, you're telling yourself, well, you know what? Tithing, it's in, the, it's in the Old Testament. It's in Exodus. It's in Leviticus. It's, it's in Malachi. It's not for me. It's not. We're under the grace. We're now, it's, you know, Jesus came and he's still alive. I don't need to tithe. I don't need to tithe. You be, yay. You're so smart. We're so smart. Ever notice that when it comes to money and tithing, we become biblical scholars. We're, we're like, we become so like, we try to find verses that, uh, uh, that go to our preferences, to our beliefs. We question God about it. We tell, we ask people if it's true, if they should give or not. We even tell people tithing, it's not biblical. We, we become biblical scholars. We're like, well, you, you can't get me here. I find it very interesting that we question God when it comes to money, but we never question the government when we have to pay taxes. I've never seen anybody sit in front of a government office questioning why we have to pay taxes. And there's like 20 line items that, that add up to I don't know how many thousands of dollars in a year. I saw my property tax about a month ago. It came to my house. And I started looking at all the line items. I'm like, why pay for that? What? What's going on? And I never go to that office and say, well, can you take this off? Because I'm not paying. What happens if you don't pay your taxes? You go to jail. Want to know what happens when you don't tithe? God still loves you. He still gives your life for you. We never question government institutions. We never question property taxes. We get mad about the sales tax we pay, but we never do anything about it. We end up paying. But when it comes to God, we get super spiritual and super biblical. Why? I'll just let that sit there for a minute. The truth is tithing, no matter if it's an Old Testament or if it's not a New Testament, it's still God's principle. It's still one of God's principles. There are many underlying laws that continue to be God's principles today. Old Testament says you can't kill. So can you kill today? You won't steal. You can't steal. Okay. So it's just because you're under the grace, are you going to steal? It's still a principle. Giving today, it's still a principle. And if we go to the New Testament, after Moses, after the law, and Acts chapter 2, verse 44 through 45, it says this. And all the believers were together and had, and had all things in common. And they, were, and they would sell their property. Whoa. And possessions. Whoa. And share them with all. To the extent that anyone had need. See, the Old Testament, the expectation was 10%. That was like the starting point. New Testament, I think it was even more. Sell your property. 
What do you have that's valuable that you could share with everybody from church or you could share with somebody that's in need? See, the first church recognized that they were under the grace that God had tied his son, Jesus, for our lives. And they said, you know what, 10% in Old Testament, that's a good start. But I think because I don't live under the law no more, I am so grateful, I am going to give perhaps even more than 10%. Where, where should you give your tithe or your offerings? Glad you asked. Exodus 34, 26 says, bring the best of your first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Where? Everybody help me please. Where? Okay, this, this guy's kind of asleep. This side, where, where should we bring our tithe? Where? Okay, we'll try it again. Where? Where? To the house of the Lord. Why? Because a church is where God is most present. This is where God is moving. And the church is partnering with other agencies to make a difference in our community. I'm going to be practical and honest. It doesn't say to do whatever you want with your tithe. It doesn't say to split it up however you want. It doesn't even say to pay the creditors, the people you owe first, like Victoria's Secret or something. Or Best Buy. It doesn't even say to pay yourself first. It doesn't even say take, bring the best fruit uh, of the first fruits to the Christian TV station. It doesn't even say take the best of the first fruits to the homeless that's on the street. It says bring it to my house. And then God says, when you do, once you do that, you're doing things in order. If in your heart you want to be good and kind, once you bring the tithe to my house, then you go ahead and help who you want to help. I know this is hard to hear. And I question God, God, why do I have to be the one saying this? I want to just reiterate this. You cannot be a fully committed Jesus follower and not prioritize your finances. You may pray. You may believe. You may feel the Holy Spirit day and night. You may even go to heaven. See you there. But if you don't tithe, are you truly following Jesus? It doesn't mean you're if you don't tithe, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Absolutely not. Does it mean you're a bad Christian? Absolutely not. And guess what? God's going to love you anyhow. Honestly, he will love you anyhow. That's why we're not under the law. But if we don't tithe, are we truly following and honoring Jesus? Proverbs 3.9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first part of your Harvest. Then your barns will be full of grain and your barrels will be overflowing with wine. The, passes, the passage suggests tithing to God involves honoring the Lord with all you have and in a certain order. It's following and showing him that he is most important to you. See, tithing and giving... Whatever you give from your heart, if you tip, if you give 10%, 20 whatever it is, what you're giving shows how much God means to you. But it's an honor the Lord with your wealth and the first part of your harvest. And I like the second part. Then your barns will be full of grain. See, you give and somehow God is going to give you back. You'll be blessed. Your business will be blessed. Your home will be blessed. Your, your bank account somehow is going to have more zeros behind the first three, four numbers. It, and I want to be clear. It's not, I don't, like personally, I don't give to get. It's not give to get. Or oh, I'm going to give this to get back from God. No, it's not like that. You, you give because you honor God. And you watch him work. You watch him work. He's going to, he'll 
have your home blessed. Your, you'll have more hours at work. Your business will be more profitable. Your family will be blessed. Your job hours will increase. You'll have peace, love, calmness. Everything's going to be in order. That is satisfaction. On Monday, Monday that passed, I was thinking, man, my home needs some, like, upgrades. I need to do this to my home. My car needs oil changes and alignments and some other stuff that we needed to do. And it was about $1,000 and everything. Um, And then Tuesday... Um, <clears throat> I went into my bank account and there was uh, some money deposited from the government, which was a thousand fifty. Um, and I said, "Upgrades for the house, alignment for the cars, oil changes. We did it. Yes, you live, Jesus. Yes." Or. Do we spend it all? And do what Cain did. And just give God leftovers. So I got my app, my church giving app. And I said, God, I got you. You can trust me. I'm not going to give you 10%. About 15%, God. Here you go. What if tithing is a test? He's testing you to see who's first. Your house, your car, your wardrobe, your stomach, Fleming's. Sushi or God? I gave to God knowing that my home needed some repairs, that my car was going right when I I told it to go left. When my car needs like a, a, a oil change, a supreme oil change, synthetic, with the good oil filter. But it was a test to see where my heart's at. And I gave to God first. And I think this is where the challenge is, the struggle is for all of us. Who's first in our lives? I could have blown it. I could have saved it. We could have got choppy. But we'd rather trust God with our finances. I gave on Tuesday, and then on Thursday I got paid, and I gave again. Because God is priority. Because God has my heart. My question to you this morning is this. What do you need to rearrange to regularly prioritize percentage giving with every paycheck? In fact, my question to you is where are you in your journey with giving? Where are you in your relationship with Jesus and giving? For a lot of us, it's tipping. Oh, I'm going to tip God. Oh, I'm going to buy 10 bucks. Oh, I'm going to pay everything and I'm going to just do this. Where are you at in your journey? Is it when you get to it? Because the reason be that sometimes we don't feel blessed because we're living our lives, organizing our resources in the wrong order. Because the reason sometimes we feel super disoriented and confused and we can't seem to get ahead in our finances because we're handling money in a disorderly way. And if we want to experience peace this morning, in the death of our souls, it's going to require that we organize and we bring the chaos of 
of our finances into proper order. And that involves putting God first because it matters. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, <clears throat> what a great topic, difficult topic, but it's a topic you spoke a lot about, money, finances. And for a lot of us, it could be difficult to hear because we have different preferences. And it simply shows that our hearts elsewhere. And for a lot of us, the challenge is putting you first. God, but I'm amazed that you tied your son Jesus for me. That was your tie. That's more than a tie. It's because of your a giving God that I am here, that we are here. God, would you help us acknowledge that and bring that into our heart and our mind that you are a giver, that you are a tither. God, and this topic, it is difficult, but it's something that you want to bring peace. It's something that you want to organize into our life because a lot of us have been giving last. A lot of us have been, been giving out of order. And God, we're so grateful because you love us no less. God, we, we, you're not going to point the finger and send us to hell. God, but it does reflect and show where our heart's at. God, and as a church, we want our heart to be aligned with yours. We want to have our finances in order. God, I want to thank you for this message. Thank you as you spoke into our hearts, into our minds. Um, I don't want this message, Father, to just be information, but it, let it transform our, our minds. Let it transform our hearts. Let us and help us put it into practice. God, because if you could do that in our life, in our faith, if you could heal us, if you could give us a job, if you could bless us, you sure can help us bring order in our finances and make you a priority. Father, we thank you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray.